Hello, I'm here with Michael Steenbeck Lidfin, and we're doing a state of human design. At long last. Yeah, it's been quite a while, and uh, lots of changes going on. Changes locally here in Santa Fe. Changes in the world. Uh, I guess you know that's what the time of mutation gets you. Mm. We're um, coming into the final couple weeks of that three and a half month transit of Gate sixty and Gate three. Mm. We have had. Uh, Gate three in the nodes and uh, gate sixty in Pluto. Mm -hmm. We have Pluto. So yeah, what what an incredible change it's been in just three short months. I think everyone's quaking with that um, difficulty at the beginning. Truly, something, yeah, something new, something new that's here. It's been a new start for me. There's been a quite a chaotic um, birth into a new time in in my life, and uh, it just seems like that's happening everywhere. The chaos. Pluto. Yeah, Pluto, truly. you know, yeah. this volcanic plutonic thing transforming the world. And it's part of the whole 2027 transition, right? It's part of the global cycle, Pluto and that gate specifically, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they, what's interesting is when you look at global cycles, how they actually coincide with or have connections to transits. Because in astrology, you look at the transits. Oh, we have um, Mercury retrograde, or we have Mars conjunct Venus, or you know, mm -hmm. or we have the bigger transits. We have Pluto, Pluto Uranus, or we, you know. Um, but with human design, we look at the global cycles, which is the movement of the basically the fixed stars and of the sidereal zodiac mm -hmm. against the tropical zodiac. But what's so amazing is that it tells a story, and that story is supported by the transits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That the story of the transformation of the world is supported by Neptune and Pluto transiting the experiential way, the human experiential way, changing our experiences fundamentally. And uh, really, we even saw the entrance of Neptune into gate 36 coinciding with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and really washing away uh, the old human experience. So yeah, there is really this movement of Neptune washing away the old and Pluto reinventing it and and sort of giving it a charge um, and pushing it. Uh, it was Stanislav Graf who said in the perinatal astrology or the kind of um, astrology of fertility or not even fertility, but I guess of pregnancy, it's Neptune that is the amniotic fluid and it's Pluto that is actually the pushing through the birth canal. Cool. That's a great so, amplification. Yeah. Interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. We're all getting pushed into a new birth. Now the new awakening is symbolized by Uranus. Mm. And that's where we open our eyes to a new reality. Mm. So the Pluto time is not yet the awakening time because we're not yet really seeing the new reality. It's mm. so chaotic. We're mm -hmm. just getting pushed through the birth canal, you know, and that's what it's felt like these past couple months. <laughs> so and in general, you never see the mutation as it happens. You only see before the mutation and after the mutation, right? So it'll be really interesting to reflect on this time after this transit is over, especially mm -hmm. being the format of mutation, the 63 of all the mutative individual channels. Like this is the one that sort of like represents how mutation functions. And the, mm -hmm. you know, that channel like just aesthetically is like so closely wrapped up with like invisibility and sudden darkness and sudden uh, and sudden sight, you know, the flick, flicking of the lights people always talk about with that mm -hmm. channel. Oh, right. How um, individuality has a kind of a flickering quality where the lights go off and they come back on and everything's different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And you don't really get to see when it changed, but that the mutation happened in the space between the frames, so to speak. So, yeah, it's been, it's been quite a time and um, at a personal level, a big transition for me. I mean, I left my job of nine years, but not really um, even nine years. I mean, I've been in stable employment since I was 18 years old. Even before that, I, uh, I skipped college and I just went straight into the workforce. And by age 23, I was working at amazon.com and I've always had a um, very stable, regular nine to five mm. job in software engineering, which has taken up so much of my energy um, I mean, I'm, I'm talking thousands of hours, 2000 hours a year, right? So wow. really beyond that, because many of these jobs, I was working 60 hour weeks. So, um, you know, I mean, that's uh, every five years, that's 10,000 hours. I was doing it, you know, for 20 years, mm -hmm. that's 40,000 hours of software development. 
And it's quite a big change to go from that into human design full time. And I've also seen how you've been doing so much human design. I mean, it's, it's almost every day. I, I see what you're up to and you have a reading or two readings or we've been teaching the class together. I know you've been doing more teaching and it's really just been incredible to see, to see how human design can support this, this type of dedicated research and commitment. And that the, it, to me, it, it's even yet another layer of the proof of the validity of human design that it, it does support this kind of thing. Like if I tried to go into human design and there was no support for it and nobody mm -hmm. was interested in it and nobody would take a class or anything, that would be a lot of resistance I'd be facing. But instead it's been the opposite. I haven't had to promote anything really. Mm -hmm. I just had to let people know and then word spreads. And it's, it's the you know same for you where um, you're being contacted all the time for, for human design. And it's, it's just nice to see. It's nice to see that, um, we are part of a collective movement that is important at this time in the evolution of human consciousness because we're going into such a crazy time. It's right. more important now than when it was kind of like the good times. Like if this, mm -hmm. you know, back in the sixties or something, it's like, Oh yeah, that's interesting. Very cool. But it's like rich people's hobbies right. and mysticism mm -hmm. or something. Exactly. And now it's like, no, we need this to survive. Right. We need this to because the time has come to fulfill our, our purposes it's incredible to see yeah and do we see these waves of it occur the closer we get to 2027 it's not like it's consistently more and more people it's like a wave up of new people you know and right now it's like one of those cresting times maybe because of this transit that's involved in the global cycle because that other one you're mentioning the 2021 that activated a lot of people brought people to human design for the first time Mm -hmm. absolutely and at 63 another thing about it too is just how catalyzing it is because it's one of these root channels and because it like you know this is also the channel that people most associate with like kundalini or stuff like that or like mm -hmm. it's a good point it is kind of a kundalini awakening channel from the root to the sacral right down the middle um and yeah it is it's it's a very um it, you know it sparks something the root is really what what fuels, but also what sparks, what, what starts it and what, what keeps pressuring it. If it fails, it tries again. It's right. like difficulty at the beginning. Well, if you, if it doesn't work, it's just going to keep, keep pushing it to, to, into that chaos. If there's no acceptance, acceptance is the fuel that allows you to start difficulty at the beginning again. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I love that. I love that. Gate 60 being, you know, limitation, but also uh, acceptance of that limitation, which really allows for the transcendence of it. People talk a lot about transcendence and it's as if it's some sort of mental concept, like you're sitting on a bed of nails, but you've transcended the pain or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, maybe, maybe if you fully accept that bed of nails. Um, but I mean, I, I think a lot of people think of transcendence without acceptance, which would be more like the narrative of the mind overcoming the challenge of the body. Mm -hmm. And that's not what human design is. It's the mind surrendering to the limitation of the body, truly. Mm -hmm. So, nice. yeah, well, we have some interesting topics to go into. I'm also excited to share some on the HDHD conference, uh, post-conference retreat, but let's see what we have in our files. So uh, first I have a quote on the 4% of 4% that Ra always talks about. And this is something where I actually finally found what I think is the source of this number. Mm. because Ra talks about the mutative core being 4% of 4%. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he means literally 4% of 4%. I think he means 4% of anything is like, there's actually a 4% of 4% of 4% of 4%. Wow. It just keeps going. Cool. That's crazy. And I believe the reason that he uses this number, like he uses it in the context of talking about the mutative core of people who are able to understand human design and sort of further the development of human consciousness and so on and uh, be the next evolutionary step. And he uses it in that way of just talking about the mutative core, the sort of avant-garde, mm -hmm. right? the avant-garde that at any given point in history, there'll be 4% of 4% who are at the core of furthering history, who mm -hmm. are kind of self-selected out of whatever category they're in into a special group. And then I guess just the 4% is the outer group of that. But, you know, it, he always would talk about the 4% and 4%. Hmm. Well, I think where he got this from is um, that when he, that it's actually thought that around 96% 
of the matter in the entire uh, universe is dark matter or mm. dark energy mm -hmm. that 96 percent of the overall mass is dark and he kind of likens that same movement or that same ratio of the atomic matter being the extreme minority he would say that the atomic matter is the hot matter and the dark uh, matter is the cold matter yeah the dark energy is cold and it's not mutative it's not changing it's it's immutable it's okay. kind of just staying the same hmm. so at any given point only 4% can be mutative and actually changing and evolving and growing. Wow. The vast majority of the structure can't be changing because if too much were changing, it would be too chaotic right. would be, and so on. So already atomic matter is the mutative matter, mm -hmm. but then within atomic matter, 4% of that matter is you know mutative. And then he kind of uses this ratio in every case where 4% of the world population at any given point is going to be the mutative part of the population. Mm. 4% of the crystals of consciousness are the mutative crystals that were near the, the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And within them, 4% again and 4% again until you kind of, you, you keep drilling down, right? So, um, but yeah, that, that's, he has a quote and he said, um, for him, it always comes down to certain things that are very simple about the nature of life. And there's one of two ways to go in this life. You just simply get carried away and that's what life does to most people. The momentum of the vast evolutionary force. Mm. It's what Thomas Pynchon says. You can't shit against gravity. Mm. It's an overwhelming process in which you are just being dragged over the cliff. So Ra goes on to say how he sees how easy it is for humanity to simply be carried away in the density of the program. But at the same time, it all goes back to the physics of the biverse. And this is the quote that kind of makes me think where the 4% comes from. Ra says about 4% is atomic. That's the hot creative force. It's possible for about 4% of humanity to mutate, possible for them to go through a transforming process that allows them to disengage from the density of the program. And out of that 4%, there's 4% of them that actually might be able to achieve that. And then you, you kind of keep going. Uh, I, I think he doesn't say that, but I, I think you could kind of continue to, to drill down. He says, it doesn't mean that it gives them any automatic key to the kingdom, but it brings them to this window. It brings them to the moment where the opportunity is there to see whether or not they're ready, hmm. because it's a readiness. It's quite something to deal with the power of mind and the power of the conditioning forces and to come out on top of that movie. You really have to have a deep, commitment to the experiment otherwise it does not work and cannot work and you can see the density of the program everywhere wow so, yeah yeah that was one that i liked i mean i'm a gate 29 i like the stories of commitment you know <laughs> determination yeah. it reminds me of a shonen manga like a hunter hunter or something the whittling down from the big group yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, um, I think you might have, well, actually, it was our friend Johnny who introduced me to uh, Hunter. Do you, you say, I always said Hunter x Hunter. Is the x silent? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. that's something that you only really know if you're really a fan of that. Uh, but I, I like Hunter Hunter. I'm a big fan of it. And actually, the, the uh, anime is actually quite good as well. Um, I was really surprised at how faithful to the, to the manga it was. So, um, but yeah, that there's so many parallels to human design and to base theory. And he knew <laughs> somehow. He absolutely, absolutely. The did. famous one is that the Nen types are the different profiles. They like fit perfectly. The six Nen types and the six uh, profiles. Very cool. I've I've got a yeah. That's that's a talk I'd like to see. Well, and just like all his discussion of like aura dynamics and Hunter Hunter, like a lot of it is like really realistic. Oh, so much of it is about aura and about yeah, and it really is this meeting of powerful beings and part of their power is in their ability to embody their unique characteristics right. in a way that they use to their advantage and it's sort of um yeah this is it's pretty cool i i really really liked it yeah so here's an interesting one uh nathan talked about um this is nathan garrison the son of ted garrison who is part of Ra's first or second cohort in Taos, New Mexico, hmm. uh, back in 95, 96. Uh, Nathan Garrison is an incredible um, 
human design, you know, figure who really helps out a lot on the Neutrino Design app, which is my favorite human design app now. And uh, everyone's raving about that. Yeah, it's yeah. a great app. Huge, huge win. Mm -hmm. And I know Nathan's not the developer, but he's worked closely with the developer. And um, they've just done such a great job on that cool. app. That's, that's just bravo, seriously. So... And what Nathan writes is the conceptual model of the brain scientists are studying now is often described as a hierarchical system that incorporates both bottom-up sensory input and top-down processing. This model suggests that the brain generates our conscious awareness by combining incoming sensory information from the environment with pre-existing internal models or expectations. Hmm. So it's the kind of top-down thing. At the bottom up level, sensory inputs from our environment, such as visual, auditory, tactile, and other sensory stimuli are transmitted to the brain through specialized receptors in our sensory organs. These raw sensory signals are then processed in lower level brain regions, such as the primary sensory areas where basic features of the stimuli are extracted. Hmm. However, the brain doesn't solely rely on bottom up sensory input. It also incorporates top-down processing, which involves the use of higher level cognitive processes, expectations, and internal models to interpret and make sense of the incoming sensory information. Hmm. These internal models are constructed based on past experiences, learning, and knowledge stored in the brain. Hmm. Right? It's really interesting to see how these combine. The top-down processes work in a predictive manner, generating hypotheses or expectations about the incoming sensory data. These hypotheses are then compared and matched against the actual sensory input. The process of matching and verification helps calibrate and authenticate the internal models with mm. the external reality. Like, is what I'm seeing real? Could this be real? Mm. I didn't expect to see this here. Or I do expect to see it. It gets a pass. There's, mm. no, there's no alarm going off. Nice. If the incoming sensory input aligns with the predictions or expectations generated by the internal models, it reinforces the existing model and leads to a sense of coherence and confirmation. On the other hand, if there's a mismatch or discrepancy between the predictions and the sensory input, it triggers a process of error detection hmm. and may lead to the revision or updating of the internal models to better align with reality, aka learning. <laughs> um, this is, a, without going too much of a sidetrack, this is also how quantum computing can work with compression algorithms where they use quantum computing to generate a library of what are called dictionary images. And those dictionary images can be recombined to create actual manifest images, the image as it results. Mm -hmm. But it's being created out of these fundamental building blocks. And basically, there's a high cost to updating the library images. So you try as long as you can to generate as many images as possible from the fundamental building blocks until you reach an impasse where no combination of building blocks would create that image, mm. then you have to update your library images. Mm. Similarly, what, how we learn something and we keep using it until it absolutely cannot explain and we're forced to give up because it's so expensive to have to get rid of cool. what we've learned and learn something new. Nice. Right? So he writes, this interplay between top-down and bottom-up processing allows the brain to create a cohesive and meaningful representation of our conscious experience. It enables us to perceive and interpret the world around us while continuously updating and refining our internal models based on new sensory information. This is where human design comes in. <laughs> we learn in human design that we each have two authorities, an inner authority and an outer authority, the mind and the body. When we use the mind for both inner and outer authority, what in fact we are doing is relying on the top-down generative mm -hmm. model, which relies on assumptions and expectations. Mm. What the strategy of type and inner authority shows us is the way we can tap up into the tap into the bottom up form principle mm -hmm. sensory input, which helps calibrate the model generated and aligns you to a path with a higher fidelity to reality. Cool. This is what is meant when Ra says that we make up the Maya. We are creating our reality as a model for conceptualizing through bottom-up sensory input when we are young until we create concepts and beliefs that can predict and expect what is happening and about to happen. The older we get, the more we rely on this top-down model unless we can stay tapped into our form. Nice. So bravo, Nathan. Really? Yeah, he just yeah. nailed it. I mean, I love this. This is human design scholarship, Truly. by the way. Yeah. I'm, I've been, you know, talking a bit about how we need more human design scholarship and we need human design libraries like the Santa Fe Human Design Library to endorse scholars and have scholarly review and so on. And this is the kind of thing that is really yeah. giving a technical, scientific, logically sound explanation 
uh, based in, in, you know, neuroscience and uh, it's, 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 it's really, you know, incredible. This he's, is the kind of thing. He's successfully yeah. providing his outer authority, his top-down model. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> very, very good. Very good top-down modeling, Nathan. And then Jan van Denberg replies and says, hi, oh. Nathan. The bottom-up, top-down approach seems biological to me. In that view, the bottom-up should, should refer to the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, which links the endocrine system and the nervous system, referring to the form principle, the design crystal, where the pineal gland refers to the top-down seat of the soul, as Start called it. Hmm. To relate to the human design system, he says his insert would be the development of self-reflective consciousness, as you know, we then biologically refer to the neocortex, the corpus callosum, the area between the limbic brain system or the mammalian brain, the emotional brain, and the cerebrum, that wrinkling mass, the latest development of the brain. We are designed for cognition, to be intelligent in a very complex way. Saying that, everything about life is about bringing cognition to the surface to be experienced as consciousness. Why he mentions this, and he goes on to say, this different approach in, uh, is that it's crucial where that potential of cognition is housed, that making up the Maya can be made up mammalian bottom up or controlled seven centered top down. However, it needs self-reflection to bring those together for true seeing to react or not in an individual way. Where consciousness is normally governed by light Transference, cutting off your body from its cognition system, is about the two Ajna-related eyes instead of the third eye, the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't 100% follow the, the connection from consciousness to light and the transference that cuts it off from its cognition hmm. through the eyes. Hmm. But I guess he's saying that the consciousness of the third eye is kind of the true seat of consciousness, but then... The consciousness of the outer vision is what sort of pulls us away from that, I guess. It's, yeah, I didn't entirely follow that. Yeah, I got lost in the middle there. But it's definitely um, this, these are the kinds of, you know, conversations um, that are really important to have. And yeah, it just makes me happy seeing, seeing these kinds of threads. I mean, you know, when I open up human design groups and I see this kind of conversation, I go, all is well in the yeah, world. Truly. <laughs> People are thinking about the right things. Yeah. They're talking about the right things. There's real conversation happening in the world. And it, it makes me really happy to see that. Mm -hmm. So, all right. The next one uh, I have is something that I'm sure people are familiar with, but this was just um, kind of in the news over the last couple months. And it's very much a 2027 sign of the times. Mm. Orcas, which are marine mammals, we're attacking ships. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, these are mammals, though. These yeah. are mammals. And what do we know about mammals? That the mammals will no, no longer peacefully coexist with us. Uh -huh. that, that the domestication of mammals is through the 1949. That channel is breaking down. It's becoming no longer a channel in some sense. It's actually a channel you have, incidentally. Mm -hmm. And that the breaking of that channel is breaking the marriage bond and is also breaking the mystical way because that is the root of the fuel of mysticism. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're kind of moving towards a post-mystical world, something very sad to think about. But part of that also sad is that for us, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess it's all, it's all perspective. Something that personally touched me was the, you know, I can imagine the loss of a lot of things, but the loss of mysticism, that's, you know, I still have PTSD from the library of Alexandria, you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, this is part of it is the the breakdown of the peaceful coexistence of mammals and human and uh, not that the orcas were domesticated they were wild but now that they're i mean they at least peacefully coexisted with us mm -hmm. and no more yeah so. well it's interesting they weren't harming humans they were just harming their ships it sounds like so they would knock them into the water for fun and then they wouldn't it's not like they would eat the people or whatever okay they okay. only ever they know. only ever kill people in captivity Interesting. But, okay. But uh, they were teaching others how to do it. They were teaching their young out the trick to knocking over human vessels. Wow. So they were passing wow. it on. That's why yeah. it was happening kind of all over. Uh, Has it stopped? I mean, was that like a little wave of punk? Orcas? Good question. Yeah, <laughs> you know, or is that just thing. is that just the new reality? I mean, now it's like you know, you know, you got to be careful of pirates. Got to be careful of orcas. Yeah, you never know whether it's the media cycle. Now that we've heard about the orcas, are we still interested in what they're up to? <laughs> are they still doing it? Who knows? 
Yeah, five years later. So the orcas are now, uh, they've now moved on from knocking over the ships to uh, they, if you feed them, they actually toll you as you go by. And if you feed them, they <laughs> let you go. No, I don't know. You know what was the other like um, fastest change of the 1949 rup coming rupture is how, um, how weird it is to drink milk now. And everyone's talking about how drinking milk is so weird. Interesting. You know, that happened yeah. in like less than a generation. No, that's a good point. People, it's like a meme now of like, you're the kind of person who drinks milk. Like, yeah. you're like, what kind of milk drinking, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so now it's a pejorative. <laughs> so um, the left and the right ear, you know, Ra would always uh, give human design readings into the left ear. Hmm. So like I could be giving you a reading now, but mm -hmm. if, if, or if you were going to give a reading, he would sit and talk into your left ear. I thought you like to give readings into the right ear. Really? I thought that's what you said. Cause you like to speak to the, the moment. The... Well, I mean, I, I will do either. I don't think I have a preference. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like whatever side I'm on, I'll, I'll deal with that. But no, I mean the, the left ear is the one where the words get in, they get past the security guard. I, I do think, yeah, it's an interesting idea. I mean, obviously we hear with both ears too. It's right. just an interesting idea of, talking directly into somebody's ear. In fact, um, I knew a kid when I was younger who went to a, a psychological retreat center where they actually would talk into each ear. They would have two people, one mm. talking in each ear. That's, that's, um, that's where, you know, you know, psychology becomes kind of, you know, aligned with uh, an interrogation technique or, yeah, sure. or something like that, right? Good cop, bad cop. You have like one therapist in each ear, mm. but um yeah, it is interesting, the difference in the ears and how the left ear is the abstract ear, is the feeling ear, it hears the um, the emotion behind and so on. And then the right ear is like for alert or for danger. And um, this was a news release from May 19th, 2023, Frontiers. And it said, our brain prefers positive vocal sounds that come from our left. The auditory cortex is less sensitive to human vocalizations from the right. Wow, wow. What do you know? So, um, yeah, the emotional valence or the valence of the sounds, where we, whether we perceive them as positive, neutral, or negative. And, uh, yeah, interestingly. So neuroscientists from Switzerland have shown an effect of direction on emotional valence. We respond more strongly to positive human sounds like laughter or pleasant vocalizations that come in through the left ear. Cool. So... Yeah, it actually gets in. It's kind of like someone's laughing in your right ear and you're like, okay, I registered their laughing. There's no danger. Mm. You know, it's there to, to check for danger. It's splenic. Right. It's there gotcha. to check what's happening. So, um, you know, another uh, note on the 63 transit and the, all the infest, I, on another video, I talked about how there's been a lot of infestations in people's lives that I've noticed, maybe because we had a hot summer, so more bugs than usual. But I've known three people this summer that have bugs lodged in their ears. Ah, <laughs> jeez. Design of insects much, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's, wow. Wow. So here is a comment on Matthew, from Matthew Sitz. Um, and this, I hope we have enough context here. I sometimes copy, copy comments off the internet. And then like later, I'm like, it's, it's, it's kind of like finding a note where you go, what did I, what was I in the middle of a dream here? What is this? What he so he says the glycine breakdown is so cool with it having the inspiring channel for the sensing circuit with friction and aloneness, you can almost see the process unfold. I see. So he's talking about glycine. Where is glycine? Well, apparently it's aloneness, friction, channel of inspiration, um, you know, and the idea comes to mind that glycine reprograms the gates where depression takes root. Ah, this was actually something we covered in a previous state of human design. That's why I, uh, at the time that I saved this, we had just talked about it. So mm. it was really hot on this. So this is kind of a follow-up. So what we were talking about is how glycine is related to depression. And we were interested in looking at what gates glycine relates to. Oh because those gates, you know, were kind of like, are they melancholy gates? Well, yeah, channel of inspiration, sure. I mean, mm -hmm. you have that one. But, um, or, you know, um, I it's guess- in, It's in 40 and 59 or six? Well, or you know, uh, that's what I'm saying is I, you know, if you want me to look it up, we're gonna have to, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, that's, I, I don't have, I don't have a walking Rolodex right, right. Right. every, that's why I was saying that, that this is, so I, I do know how to find that though. 
Nice. Um, you have that. I have the ray of codon mapping. Wow. <laughs> okay, keep it handy here, you know, just in case we're talking about glycine. Yeah. <laughs> It'll take me a moment to, to pick it up. So uh, glycine is gate six, gate okay. 40, gate 47 and 64. I see. So it's not a channel of, of inspiration. Or, or, what, what I would think of as inspiration is 6124. He was saying, uh, yeah, right. He was saying it's about, um, I guess, it inspires the it's a channel of abstraction but it inspires the abstract process the abstract stream so i see so when uh, matthew yeah he says it's the inspiring channel for the sensing circuit that, oh, that one yes, inspiring yes, kind yes, of thing yeah, i see yes so it starts it up so it's yeah that's 64 47 40 and 6 mm -hmm. and uh so he says you can see how the process unfolds. The idea that comes to mind is glycine reprograms the gates where depression takes roots, takes root. Looking at the gates in the context of the illness not only helps us to understand it better, but how the cure works as well. First, it's abstract and tribal. Yeah, six and, and 40 are tribal, mm -hmm. 47 and 64 are abstract. Mm -hmm. So this describes why depression is so hard to understand for the victims and their loved ones and why the symptoms appear as isolation from relationships. Mm. Uh, now to go through the gates, the channel that really, the, the channel stands out. So let's start there. The 4764 describes the mental doom spiral of depression, mm. confusion without realizing the story, mm. right? It's like when that channel is not operating correctly, right? It's meant to take this confusion of images and find a way to string them together into cohesion. Mm -hmm. But depression is to take the mental images and not be able to turn them into a story. Right. To feel like there's no story here. It's pointless, it's meaningless. It's really a loss of meaning, the inability to, to remove the confusion of images through the meaning. To arrange them, you know, it's these are harmonia is the projector part of the projector corner. All these gates are in harmonia, so they all go, um, yin yang yin yang and then in the case of 64 yin yang yin yang yin yang all the way up absolutely as, it's as the projector as it gets ah the ultimate uh the ultimate projector gate very interesting yeah because that that uh, yin yang diagram is the projector diagram from from kind of a fundamental level there so um well in base four it's even if it wasn't associated with projectors it's like base four is also arranging it's like art uh, it's like, yeah how is it arranged how is it designed the, the, yes the element of design that's a good point so if you're unable to arrange the images in a way that makes sense depression is the result because it's like having an overwhelming flood of images that can't be arranged that can't be designed or placed into an order. So mm -hmm. you end up with this chaos, this doom spiral mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, yeah, as, as Matthew calls it. So next is, oh, wait, 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 he says, the doom spiral of depression, which is confusion without realizing the story. And every time they reflect on the past, they can't get the story out mm -hmm. and that eats away at them. Mm -hmm. Next is the friction from gate six. This unshared story is eating away a hole in them. And now that the energy is agitated, the victim is driving away more and more people in this agitation from an unshared story that they can't put together, mm. creating all this friction. And oh. finally, they are alone, not by choice, but by mechanics. And so they continue to make their life into a more and more confusing past. <laughs> But then comes a change. A story is recognized and shared and deconditioning can begin without being replaced. And glycine helps with the deconditioning so you can get back to being yourself faster. Uh, and then he says his knowing circuitry is tingling with the idea that glycine works by breaking the conditioning in these gates. Wow. Wow, that's really interesting. It'd also be interesting to see if people who don't have channels there um, are more likely to have depression because they don't have their own internal. I mean, I guess it could happen either way. Either you have a channel there and it's not operating correctly, or you don't have a channel there and the conditioning is building up right. and it's getting stuck. And the cure would be different in each case. In one, it's the deconditioning. In the other, it's the channel operating correctly, like the 659 operating through emotional clarity and sacral response, that 3740 operating through being invited to be part of a group that's bigger than you. Mm. And that 6447 being recognized for making sense of, of the confusion. Mm. 
yeah, that's a really, really interesting one. I'm, I'm glad we, you know, at first it's like, oh, we got to look up glycine. And then, oh, no, no, I have the rave code on yeah. <laughs> right here. Just give me a that minute. Was just give me a minute. So uh, just a couple more. And then we can maybe, I want to talk a little bit about the conference. Okay. Uh, so Jan van Denberg has his book, Evolution to Laws, that was released April 21st, 2023. This is another great, great one from Jan. We may have... You know, announced this last time, but really, I can never do too much to to publicize Jan's work because um, he's doing true human design scholarship, and uh, that's where he looks at the two laws of evolution, basically the laws of the Einsteinian, you know, relativism, and then the laws of base theory, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the yeah, how that works together. Examining cell phone data, researchers determine that the human body has rhythms that range from seven to 52 days. Mm -hmm. Research has shown that recurring patterns do not occur only in these kinds of psychological and neurological conditions, but that everyone has cycles lasting several days. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a proof that we have these bio rhythms or bio cycles. And yeah, really interesting. I mean, um, rhythms that range from seven to 52 days. Well, you know, 52 days, I mean, actually both of those are very profound from the science of the cards because there's 52 cards and we already oh. look at 52 day rhythms mm -hmm. in cards of destiny and then seven of course the uh, seven days of the week and we also look at that and that's kind of at the heart of the study of the cards so yeah very very interesting uh okay i guess this will be the last one let's do this one then we'll okay. call it. so this is a quote from ra you see the public will be able to take advantage of design that's not the same as becoming your design. Don't think for a moment that any popularization of human design is going to bring about everyone who is interested in that to this kind of level of recognition and understanding. They'll take advantage of the techniques that are revealed through type and design, but that's something quite different than living it. <laughs> yeah. Seven years out of your life. And the only way in which we grow is that we have to be in communion with those who are also aware of their design. Damn, he so, said it. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. Uh, so there good. really is a limit to how much you can live your design if you don't have other people that are following it, I guess. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, like you can tolerate, um, you know, auras that aren't, that are whatever distorted from conditioning or whatever. And you can go and you can, you know, not let that affect you. You keep following your own design, spend time alone or whatever, but you're not really getting any clean condition. If you're around people who are living their design, they have these coherent auras, they're still conditioning you, but like what it is that you're like learning from them chemically or whatever is like a lot more, um, I don't know, gratifying. You know, it's like, I still, it's like, I still don't want to like borrow your 952 or anything and take it for my own, but it's like, I get to enjoy it when it's around more cleanly than some homogenous version of that channel. Mm. You know, it's like, yeah. I kind of don't really get to experience the 952 and someone who's not living their design. I just get sort of a pale imitation of it. Well, and you know, what I've noticed is just how good for the spirit it is, uh, how lucky I end up feeling. I mean, when I look at the attendees for it, HDHD, or I look at people who signed up for my class, or I, I just look at the people in my life, even here in Santa Fe, or the people who come to Santa Fe, um, I feel so lucky. And that sense of luck, it is kind of like gratitude, but it's not ego gratitude. I mean, I feel that too. And I have learned to, to feel that I've learned from, you know, defined egos, um, you know, quite a bit of what is a false gratitude versus a real gratitude and so on. But I'm talking more about just in the spirit itself that um, the best antidote for despair, you know, mm -hmm. for ennui, you know, is this what gives me faith um, that I'm in the right place is partly the right people and the people that share the spirit of that place and that being able to uh, build something like the HDHD conference, which we've built together and seeing the people it brings in and their spirit and the spirit they bring to it enlivens my spirit. Um, and so you really do, it's funny because human design seems almost anti-spiritual at first. And of course, Ra was very careful not to make it another spirit focused thing. You know, he was mm -hmm. very careful to say, this is about the form, this mm -hmm. is not about the spirit so much, but at the same time, uh, that is one of the great signposts of living your design is the, the feeling of lucky 
how lucky we are to have this front row seat and to be surrounded on either side by so many others who have the same front row seat to this moment in human evolution and human consciousness at the global scale that we are all sharing and witnessing this through the lens of an occult knowledge that gives us such an intimate behind the scenes look at how it all works. It's, it's really special. So uh, yeah, as much as the mind kicks and screams and clings to it's like other forms of spirituality, when you first get into design through deconditioning, you know, giving up your sort of spirituality and your religion and stuff like that in so many ways you you know the mind resists that but then it comes to really appreciate what it's given and it has this much broader um, access to spirit in a way it's like when the mind actually ex is existing as a witness or as a passenger it's just like it's it's range and it's um and it's visibility of the spirit is just that much more unclouded mm. yeah uh, well said it's not right it's not uh, as uh, ug krishnamurti said looking for enlightenment is like the drug addict looking for their next fix. Well, that's when the mind is looking for enlightenment mm. as something that will sate it because it's not, uh, it's not looking in the right place. You know, it's not, it's not looking to surrender to what would, what would bring a deeper, a deeper um, purpose even. I mean, it's funny to, to talk about purpose, but it, I, I do see it as um we did come here for a reason and that is the foundation of the mysteries is kind of why am i here not even why am i here why is this here mm -hmm. why is there this and not mm -hmm. nothing and ultimately human design gives us the answer to that and the answer is decision making and it comes down to something very fundamental which is the decisions that we make or the, the decisions that our awareness allows us to make because by changing our awareness new possibilities the horizon of possibility shifts. And so without even realizing it, we've been mutated. And that mutation takes hold through the changing of the conditions of possibility and the horizons of possibility such that we now see ourselves making decisions that were impossible for us to make before. Mm. It's not that I decide to make a different decision. It's that I witness myself making a decision that was impossible for me to make in a different situation because I didn't have the awareness that had allowed for that decision, or I hadn't been mutated in that way. I, mm -hmm. I was simply, like we started this whole thing with that raw quote about the forces of conditioning pushing us over the cliff. Mm -hmm. It's being able to get up above those waves. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, well, just two last things I wanna look at um, just very briefly here. And uh, well, I guess three things. The first is the remote access pass for HDHD this year. So uh, well, that's such a funny pivot after the well, profound I know, video. I know, but you know, the spiritual and the mundane, yeah. sacred moving, and the profane. Moving from the uh, G to the uh, eco center now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. From the capital S self to the little S self. But uh, no, I mean, but it is actually a segue in so far as I feel so lucky yeah. to call these people my friends and to call you my friend and that we you know, together have this group, uh, friends and colleagues. I mean, just so special. Mutants. All these, yeah, these, all these great faces here. Uh, in uh, yesterday's class on the lines, we did a whole class on uh, faces and on facial expressions and how, mm. uh, well, really how our faces change, how the face is kind of a mask, but the masks that we wear collectively versus tribally versus personally. And um, some really interesting conversation. We had a post-class uh, conversation about it and really just kind of discussing um, how, you know, if you're a projector and you, you're trying to be recognized, are you trying to be recognized wearing a face of bitterness about mm. not being recognized? Because people will see that more than they see your words telling them or hear your words saying, I should be recognized mm. um, that the face itself shows so much and that, you know, to trust a general, to trust a fifth line and a, who's a perfect stranger and you come into the, you know, emergency room and that doctor, that five, five one doctor is there. If they have the face of a general that says, Oh yeah, we're, we're doing what we can. You trust them. But if they don't have the face of a general, you're worried, you know, you don't trust them. And the same with the face of a savior, the savior who can listen 
uh, or the face of empathy or the face of authority or any of these line mm, themes, how they come out in the face and how that face already says so much before any word is spoken. I'm going to mm. talk a lot about the aura doing the talking. Well, the face also does the talking. Mm -hmm. uh, so just whether those face muscles are tense, whether there's an internal conflict, whether they're relaxed. So yeah, this isn't the complete list because uh, we've now added added quite a bit to it, but this is mostly up to date, but it's this and more. Um, and so this is the remote access pass for those who can't be in Santa Fe in person, um, streaming as well as downloads from the workshops. And uh, yeah, I mean, we just announced a new workshop today. So it's, it's really, quite an incredible group of people that we have gathered and just a lot of great information. And so um, there is a tiny URL for this. It's tinyurl.com slash remote dash access dash pass. It will redirect you to this uh, Canvas site here, which um, thank you, Brandy, for letting me host this on her Canva. But um, yeah, there's a link here to buy their own access tickets. And we also have payment plans which are uh, as low as $25 a month. Hmm. So, I mean, you can literally watch hours and hours of human design content. Um, and next best thing to coming to the conference itself. Now here's the next thing I wanted to show, which is the HDHD art book this year. And uh, that's actually not gonna be a white page, that's black. We did it in black and red. It's cool. just that the preview doesn't uh, doesn't show nice. the end, the end page there. So black and red, personality and design, kind of one of the themes here. Um, we have so much in this. I mean, we have, well, your art is in it. We mm. have uh, Alokanand Diaz and Shea Labe, Lori Marie. Uh, Taylor did some awesome images this year. Dewan Manuel did this incredible film on rave cosmology that we have uh, images from. Uh, Milana Waldron, Genoa Blyven, uh, Lucita Shalev. I mean, so many people, um, so much incredible work here. And it was just so much fun making this. This was something where I didn't really know what would go into it. Um, I mean, 2946, it's experiential. I, uh, I started building it. And then once I started, I knew that I, I couldn't stop until it was done. And mm. of course, when you start a new experience, you don't know when it's gonna be done. Mm. Could be done in a day, could be done in a month. Thankfully, this was done in about uh, 10 days or maybe 14 days, I don't know. There, were, there was a good solid gate worth of very intensive work. I would say it's, it, it, it's, it's almost like you get to the sixth line of a gate and if you haven't finished it, you know that you're gonna have to get to the sixth line of the next gate to get mm. it done, you know? It's like, okay, this story isn't isn't quite done yet. We gotta keep going. But uh, yeah, really, really fun stuff. These are all images of rave cosmology, big bang. So anyway, I'll kind of, uh, oh yeah, Lori Marie, I mean. Those pages look great. Uh, yeah, wow. So that's such good design that she did. Uh, let's see what we have here. Yeah, Shay Shay Lebe did some pretty cool punky DIY. Her Ooh. design just on her own most matches our style without Fair her enough. trying to match our style at yeah. all. I mean, it's just like this is our style that we kind of developed for this very DIY punk aesthetic. Here we have um, the open mouth with a little tab of acid with Ra's face on it. I mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty great. So yeah, let's see what we have here. Uh, art by Milana Waldron. Lots of fun quotes, graphics. Oh, here we have Genoa. Genoa did um, an essay just for this. Nice. We have art from my mom. This is my mom's work. And you know, she's came to the conference last year. She'll be there again this year. Um, and she came to the Pura Vida retreat. So she's a 1-3 reflector on the cross of the unexpected. Art by Brynja Magnuson. Um, Lots of photos by Feliciano from the conference last year. So just really sweet, sweet photos. Um, and then we have all of these raw photos by Stephen Rebolito. Cool. So these are just it's one of my favorite. Rare raws. Photos. Yeah, these are all, you know, original unpublished raw photos that were the, the first published. I left it in like this because you said you didn't mind. I think it's cool. Yeah. yeah. I, 
his shadow is kind of off a little, but it does make it look like a different, you know, I don't know, a different angle or something, a little more 3D. So I left that. Um, yeah, just really, I cropped this one out like that. I just, <laughs> nice. I just liked it, you know. It's like, it's like, how often do you look at Ra's hands? Yeah, you know, really. I wish we had his palms. That would be very <laughs> interesting for. We got story. your palms in here. Yeah, that's something I put in there because one of the things we're doing this year at the conference, oh, this is Awak Diaz and his excellent mosaic he made. Um, yeah, one of the things we're doing at the, at the conference this year is um, we have palmistry. So I hmm. thought it would be nice to put, uh, there we go, <laughs> for any, any palmistry people out there. Uh, I wanted to put the prints themselves, but I just figured, well, might as well just show the palms and that way you can really see the original you know who needs a copy but um von paul art gotta love von's art here really fun quotes yeah i mean this what a what a fun book i just had such a good time making it <laughs> uh, von's little body graphs he made up there so um Oh, and then look at these. These are some of yours. Mm, very nice. Yeah, yeah, these and some comics. Um, a lecture Mike and myself gave, transcribed. So yeah, the whole thing is 280 pages and uh, being printed in the UK, mailed here. And it, um, because of the weight of the package, I was able to calculate that each book is around five pounds. I mean, these are heavy books. Cool. That's, that's a pretty heavy book. Real art books. 280 pages. Um, yeah. There's our thank you page. And, uh, yeah. So really excited about that. And then the last thing I want to show, and then we'll wrap up, is that we're doing the post-conference retreat. And I had a couple of people ask me if it's open to those who didn't come to the conference. And yes, it is. Uh, previous years, it wasn't. You know, the post-conference retreat was something just for exclusively for people who came to the conference who wanted to decompress and so on. But this one actually is. Mm -hmm. And um, there will be a lot of people from the conference there. But if you're at home watching this and you're interested in coming to Santa Fe, you couldn't make it to the conference for some reason, consider coming to, the, to this because uh, it's pretty, it's going to be pretty special. So it's... Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's coming together to be really a nice, a nice time. Uh, basically, Let's get to yeah, that was my, <laughs> yeah. right. My little message about, uh, about the need to kind of get in touch with our role in the bigger picture. And so we'll be doing um, two days on one day off, two days on one day off. And then mm -hmm. the final day, which is my 40th birthday. And thank you. And uh, big celebration. Um, and everyone will, will will still be teaching human design that day and you know learning human design because that's something i love to do but um yeah basically what we have is starting on tuesday september 19th we're going to be doing i'll be doing morning sessions on base theory mike will do afternoon sessions on rave cosmology then we have base theory day two rave cosmology day two then we have a day off because you know part of it is i wanted to make it projector friendly right variable friendly people who are just tired from having been at the conference friendly or people who didn't come to the conference because it seemed like it would be too much chaos or something. Mm -hmm. And really just give us all a chance to get to know each other. You know, we're in quarter of duality. We want to just hang out, get to know each other, have plenty of time around the campfire kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking um, it really depends who comes and we'll, we'll make sure, but it's looking like Wednesday night, we will go to Russell's, which is Sandmont Ranch. Mm -hmm and spend the night there and so that way thursday we'll kind of wake up in this beautiful remote area we can go to plaza blanca we can go to rio chama if we want we can mm. go um just you know to kind of get out of town have this nice field trip day then, then we come back and we have global cycles and astrology where um these actually go very hand in hand because richard will be doing forecasting of transits so nice. we'll be looking at transits from both astrology and human design so he'll be doing the transits and I'll be looking at global cycles, locks and keys. And uh, so we have two days of that. But, you know, these days are very light. I mean, we're, we're going to be doing class and Q&A, but then we're also going to have plenty of time to just hang out, get to know each other. Um, I'll be doing readings for people, um, kind of, you know, free of charge if people are here. I know Ashley Gray Duncan said she'll be doing that as well. And uh, Richard said the same. And if you have extra time and if you want to look at people's charts, but also, I mean, I don't want it to be just that 
we're doing readings for them. I want it to be a two-way street that we're all communicating together mm -hmm. and that we're connecting together. Um, not that it's just a one-way thing, you know, uh, but, but having these field trip days is a nice way to kind of break it up. Um, and then going for the symposium on the planets on my birthday, this will be like Plato's symposium, like, like wine and grapes and cheese and nice. things like that. You know, we have, uh, we have Rachel, uh, Palella, actually. So we'll have a chef for the whole thing, mm. which is really nice. Uh, Rachel is an amazing chef. She'll be able to cater to people's dietary needs and, and make special meals and so on. And so having her for the whole event. So overall, I'm just really excited about it. These are some of the ideas for things we can do. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conference. The conference is obviously going to be five incredible days of just nonstop whirlwind. I'm also looking forward to the post-conference because that is a time when we can really decompress and relax. In previous years, the post-conference has kind of been a time where I've actually been able to, be, I'm so busy managing yeah. the conference that right, I'm kind right. of working the whole time. In the post-conference, obviously I'll be, I'll be talking some, but this really gives an opportunity to just hang out and, and just spend some quality time. I'm a big quality time person. That's my, that's my love language. Definitely. The aura does the talking. Enough, exactly. enough lectures. And exactly. How about hanging out for once? Yeah, exactly. So even though we have these topics and I will be talking on them, it'll be like talking and then opening up to group discussion. Very nice. So yeah. And I, I imagine the same for, for yours. So um, yeah, really just, if people are interested in coming, there's a website for it. I can post a link in the YouTube. And uh, this also has a payment plan where you can pay as little as $100 a month, which is nice for people who, who need that. And I'm really just trying to, in this new phase, really offer, offer more uh, tangible benefits that are affordable, that can help people. As you were saying, it's it's hard not having people in your life. We're so lucky having people in our life to share this with, and a lot of people aren't. So I'm trying to have more retreats, more hmm. opportunities to connect in aura with others. And, For people uh, to find their fractal. Exactly, exactly. So come come to Santa Fe and, and see if it's your fractal. It probably is if, you, if you're watching this. I mean, well, not necessarily that your fractal is here in Santa Fe, sure. but that there's so many people like looking for their fractal at. Yeah, Santa that's a good point. And that there, it's kind of, it acts as a sort of a hub world of people coming from all over. But don't know undefined Gs come for that reason. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I say that as, as a defined G, our role is to keep the fire burning. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of that is how many years can we keep it burning for, especially with the fifth line theme of stamina, right? Mm -hmm. Just keep that fire burning. Um, Genoa asked me how many years I would be doing high desert human design. And it was such an absurd question I couldn't really <laughs> answer because I'm a 45. You got to kill a 45 to get rid of them. I mean, wow. it's, it's, it's kind of like, how many years will I be doing this? This is what I do. It's like mm -hmm. asking like a tennis player, how many years they'll play tennis. Right. Asking a jazz musician, how many years are you going to play jazz for? You knew that pretty early too into your experiment that you found the thing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. It was, uh, it's a gift, you know, it's a gift to have found your calling. Mm -hmm. um, it's the voice of God, right? That's where we get the term uh, vocation. So even though we don't cool. talk much about God and human design, if you want to go back to the mystical trappings of the Middle Ages, where the idea of a vocation came from, it's that you hear the voice of God that tells you what you're here to do, it gives mm -hmm. you your purpose. And I know that uh, being a 2946, I, I don't, I never know how long things will last, but uh, you know, it could last for a night or a lifetime. And this seems to be lasting for a lifetime. So. all right well thanks for watching everyone and um yeah you can always reach out to me if you have any questions about any of the art book uh remote access any of it or the g center let's talk about all of it nice <laughs> thank you